Well, good morning. It's great to see you here this morning. Thank you for gathering to worship our great God on this beautiful Sunday morning. And if you're visiting with us today for the first time, a special welcome to you. We're so glad that you have decided to join us today. And uh, we'd love to find out who you are and get to know you a little bit. So we would ask in between the seats as a welcome card, if you'd fill that out during the service and afterwards, just go out into our lobby and look to your right. You'll see a room called the Connections Room. And some of our pastors are there. We have a gift for you. But we just want to get to know who you are and see how we as a church uh, can help you. So thank you so much for being here this morning. Well, last Sunday night, we were blessed to welcome 28 new members into our church family. So let's make sure and thank the Lord for that. And uh, you're so eager to clap, I didn't even give them a chance to stand. If any of you are here this morning uh, that became members last Sunday night in this service, just stand up quickly so we can acknowledge you. Thank you so much. Welcome to the family. Well, today is a special day. Uh, Pastor Jim will be preaching this morning, which we're excited about. And then tonight, we have a special farewell and commissioning service. Uh, Jim and Susan won't be leaving us till the end of July, but we know that everyone starts dispersing in the summer. So we wanted to have a great time as a church family tonight. So at 6 o'clock, there will be a farewell service and commissioning service with Pastor Jim, followed by fellowship downstairs. So you'll make sure and be here for that. And then next Sunday is our Father's Day community outreach, fire up the grill. You see more things are being added to our property outside as the days approach. Um, just a few important reminders. We have only one service next Sunday, and it is at 11 o'clock. Good job. So, we're trusting you will all be here, plus you'll be bringing friends, and you're going, where's everyone going to sit? Well, here's the deal. Next Sunday, we'll have the service in here, but it will also be um, streamed to the fellowship hall will be over uh, overflow seating, as well as our 301 chapel across the road uh, will also be overflow seating. So there'll be lots of space. So just make yourself, uh, remind yourself of that. Secondly, parking. Uh, unless you're elderly or unable, uh, we will need you to park off-site next Sunday. So Bow Valley Public School, Hillsdale Public School, side streets, Let's be good neighbors. Please don't block any of our neighbors' driveways, all right? So uh, just find a place on the side street to park, uh, but there will be a place available for uh, those who are unable to. And then after the service, next Sunday, we'll go out and enjoy a barbecue with all our friends from the community who have gathered that day. So please make sure and come early, make sure and bring a friend, and please this week be praying. We are anticipating having up to 5,000 people on our campus next Sunday, and so we're asking that you would be praying that God would open eyes that are shut, ears that are not hearing, to the good news of the life we have in Jesus Christ. Do we have a great life in Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters? Amen. So let's, uh, let's host our community well next week, and uh, we are so excited to begin our service today by seeing people obey the commands of Christ, and to be baptized, and to identify themselves as followers of Jesus Christ. And so, Pastor Dan, thank you for leading us. Yes, we're excited to have a uh, mother and a son getting baptized as they walk in obedience together this morning to Christ. So uh, I'm first going to invite Megan Sherwin down to share her testimony. Hello, my name's Megan. I was fortunate to be born into a loving Christian family. I grew up going to church regularly and accepted Christ as my Lord and Savior as a child. While I would always consider myself a Christian, that's as far as it went, I would go to church and then go home and live life on my own. Um, what I can see now looking back is that the dots didn't connect for me. While I always believed, I didn't know who God was. As I grew older and left home, church became less of a priority and I didn't go regularly for a number of years. After having my first two children, it became a priority to get back to church, and that's when I started attending Calvary with my family. A few years ago now, my life was turned upside down, and it was then that my faith was truly renewed and the dots started to connect for me. While it's been a challenging few years, and years I never would have made it through on my own, I have seen firsthand what the power of prayer can do, and I saw how God can take horrible events and use them to bring forth many blessings. Now looking back, I can see God's hand throughout my life, guiding me, especially these past few years. Um, God placed some truly wonderful Christian neighbors in my life who turned into wonderful friends and amazing supports for me and my family. I know now that I'm never alone and He provides a way even when things seem impossible. A verse that I've leaned on is John 16, 33. 
I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Well, I have two questions for you, Megan. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. And is it your desire, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to follow him as the Lord of your life for the rest of your life? Yes. Well then, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And next up, I'd like to invite Hunter Sherwin into the waters of baptism to share his testimony. Hi, my name is Hunter Sherwin, and I want to be baptized today in order to follow Christ's example and because Jesus commands it. I was raised in a Christian home and have been surrounded by people who love the Lord and serve Him. I received Jesus as my Savior at a very young age and fully understand that I was a sinner and that Jesus died for me. I know I belong to Him and, I, and desire to serve Him. My whole family attends Calvary and I enjoy serving here and participating in youth events. When I was really young, I always had my grandma read to me from the Bible. Most of the time I had her read from Genesis. I enjoy the story of creation and learning how everything came to be. My favorite verse is Psalm 18, 2 and 3. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God and my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold I call upon Yahweh, who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Well, I have two questions for you, Hunter. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. And is it your desire, with the help of the Holy Spirit, to follow Him as the Lord of your life for the rest of your life? Yes. Well then, based on your profession of faith, my brother, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite Shannon Andrews down first into the waters of baptism to share her testimony. Hi, my name is Shannon Andrews. I grew up in a Christian household, going to church every Sunday and learning how to love and obey God. When I was about seven years old, I realized that just believing did not mean I was saved. I went home from church that morning and received Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior. I learned how Christians are supposed to act and what we are commanded to do. I never thought much about baptism because I was already saved, but recently in the last three to four years, I have grown much closer to God and witnessed his miracles firsthand making me consider how I need to obey him. A verse that has helped me a lot is Romans 8.18. I consider that our present suffering are not worth comparing to the glory that will be revealed in us. I'm getting baptized today because it is a command from God and I have chosen to do as he says. Well, I have two questions for you. Have you received Jesus as your personal savior? Yes. And is it your desire with the help of the Holy Spirit to follow him as the Lord of your life for the rest of your life? Yes. Well then, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And next up, uh, I'd like to invite uh, Vanessa Wallace into the Waters of Baptism to share her testimony. Hello, my name is Vanessa Wallace, and I come before you today to share how God has reached my life and to take the next step in walking in obedience with Him. I've attended Calvary Baptist Church almost all my life, and so I have known the message of our Lord from an early age. Although I'm not sure exactly when, I would say that I truly received Jesus as my Savior several years ago. This being a time when I started to learn that my faith isn't about following religion, but is about my personal re relationship with Jesus Christ. As a child, I experienced my family go through some dark times. And although, although the Lord brought us out of that time, which I am forever grateful for, I cannot say that it didn't leave pain in my heart. A few years after this, the world underwent the chaos of the pandemic, and this caused even more numbness to enter my heart. At the time, I felt so numb to the world around me and to my own emotions. 
bad news just became news. As I became aware of my state, I remember asking God to break me, to force me into surrendering. I knew that the way I was living did not reflect the life I claimed to have in Him. I knew that God was a God of love, joy, and peace, and then my heart was instead filled with apathy and buried pain. And so I called to Him to save me and change me. This has been my journey for the past few years now, trying to let my guard down, to make myself open and vulnerable to God, and to stop pushing away my emotions. I still struggle to give Him control sometimes, but I trust that He will continue to answer my prayers and will guide me through as I learn to process pain and accept joy in my life. This has been part of my hesitation with taking this step of baptism, that I still struggle sometimes in experiencing doubt and fully trusting God. But my hesitation comes from a worldly view, that I should take this step, this next step once I feel as though I have earned it. But that is not the case, for being able to take steps of obedience is a gift that is given by God. It is not something to be earned. This was reminded to me by some of the leaders here at church, teaching me, one, that baptism is a step of obedience that comes alongside the daily effort to obey God in life, and two, that my past should not discourage me from being obedient now, and that obedience to Christ is never a wrong step. With this, I have been reminded that baptism is not about me or my struggles, but is about the love and salvation that comes through Christ Jesus. It is to declare that He has rescued me, and I want to commit my life to following and growing in relationship with Him. I am headed towards a time in my life that comes with big changes, and so as I move forward, I want it to be clear that it is my desire to spend my life walking with Jesus, and that when I look to my future, I cannot picture a life not led by Him. I am here today to be obedient to God and to share that I no longer live my life walking in fear and indifference, but want to live in hope and love, which is the life that God has graciously made available to us through His Son. I want to thank all family, friends, youth, church leaders, and volunteers who have walked with me and prayed for me along this journey. God bless. Well, I have two questions for you. Have you received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. And is it your desire with the help of the Holy Spirit to follow him as the Lord of your life for the rest of your life? Yes. Well, then, based on your profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, as Vanessa just said, obedience is a gift from God, and it's never wrong to obey God. So if you are following Jesus, you're walking with him, and you've yet to be baptized, please come talk to a pastor today, and we can help you along in that journey. Let me pray for these ladies. Lord, I thank you that you have saved both these uh, young ladies, that they are passionate about loving you and following you with all of their life. Thank you that you prompted them to take the step of obedience today and that uh, you have promised to continue to be with them through your indwelling spirit as they uh, go where you lead them, Lord. So we pray for these ladies as they continue to serve you with their lives, that they would rely on you for all their strength and as the source for all their power, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, that's such an amazing way to begin our morning. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We are here to rejoice in the Lord because he has done so many great things and he is a great God. So there is joy in the house of the Lord today. Amen. Would you stand with us and let's declare that truth that there is joy in the house of the Lord because of what Christ has done and who Christ is. Let's sing. the God who was, we worship the God who is, we worship the God who evermore will be. He opened the prison doors, he parted the raging sea, and my God, he holds a victory. Yeah. Oh.
service declaring that our great God is worthy of all praise and all honor and all glory. Amen? Please be seated. Well, let's continue in a spirit of rejoicing, a spirit of gladness that salvation belongs to the Lord. And because of that, we can talk to our Heavenly Father. Will you join me in prayer? Father, thank you so much for this morning. Thank you for the blessing of being here today. What a privilege it is that you've put breath in our lungs, given us health in our bodies to be able to gather together to worship you and to say thank you for the great salvation that you have given us. Oh God, thank you for your love for us. Thank you for the, your love for us that you demonstrated even while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die for us so that we can be filled with gladness and be people of rejoicing today. God, I ask for forgiveness for the times when we lack gladness, when we lack displaying a heart that is full of rejoicing. God, you have been so good to us. Would you remind us, restore to us the joy of your salvation, that we would be a people that are full of gladness and rejoicing and live in such a way through the power of your spirit that others will notice something different in us and desire that. Father, that's what we're praying for, for next Sunday. That as you bring many people onto our campus next Sunday, Father, I pray that they would just sense something different about the people who gather here during that week. Lord, I pray that you would help us to be great hosts next week, to be welcoming, to be inviting. And I pray, God, that you will bless every aspect of our outreach next Sunday. All the preparation and the planning that needs to take place this week, God bless it. I praise and thank you, Father, that you control even the weather. And so, God, we ask that you would grant us favor and give us good weather for next Sunday. But, God, our prayer for this whole day is that people will come to experience this new life in Christ that we have. God, would you save many people from our community next week? Would you bless Pastor John Vermilia as he prepares the message this week? God, put on his heart the message for our community. And I pray that you'd give many people the gift of faith to believe in Jesus Christ. So, Father, we commit next Sunday to you. And with the idea of mission and reaching the lost, we thank you for our mission partners today. We thank you for John and Jackie Taylor and for the work that they do with ABWE and getting the gospel out and equipping workers across cultural settings to tell people about the wonderful life in Christ that is available. God bless them. May this be a great season of fruit in their ministry. And Father, I thank you that although you control the universe, you allow us to call you Father. And you're fully aware of every situation in our lives and what is going on. And so God, today I pray for our brothers and sisters in our church family who you know are struggling with health concerns, represented by Arnold and Gladys. We think of Vicki and Susanna today, for Roger and Gord, for Steve, Carrie, Andy, and Allison. Father, I pray that you would minister to your children. I pray that you would encourage them today. I pray that the peace that passes human understanding would guard their hearts and minds in Christ Jesus as you walk with them on the journey that they are traveling right now. Thank you that you are our healer. Nothing is impossible for you. So our desire, God, and our request is that if you're willing, would you heal their physical bodies? Strengthen them so that they might be able to return and worship with us. But Father, I thank you that you never leave us, you never forsake us, and may they be overwhelmed with a sense of your presence in their lives today. We also think of those in our church family who are grieving the loss of loved ones. We think of Sandra Goodger on the passing of her mom, and we think of Yvonne Brasnell on the passing of her brother. God, comfort these two ladies. Thank you that you are the God of all comfort. Minister to them, encourage them, help them as they process the reality that a relationship that they have known and enjoyed for a time is, has ended. And God, I just pray that you would be near to them, and I pray that you would comfort them. We also rejoice with those who you have given new life to. We thank you for Nick and Alexis Wright, and we celebrate with them the safe arrival of their son Jude. Thank you for Jude, Lord. Thank you for the gift that you have given to Nick and Alexis. Bless them, equip them, and help them as they raise Jude to love you and to serve you with all of his heart. We rejoice with them. Father, we thank you that every Sunday we get to hear from you. You speak to us through your word. And we thank you for Pastor Jim this morning. And as he opens up your word in a few minutes, God, I thank you for the meal that you have prepared for our spiritual nourishment this week. And I pray that you just help him to deliver that well. And I pray that your word will change us and will transform us and will change the way we think. And God, I pray that we will be enriched through your word this morning. 
Father, thank you for how well you take care of us. You not only meet our needs, but you are so generous. You go above and beyond that. Thank you for how you are resourcing your ministry to get the good news of Jesus Christ out to our city, our community, and our world. And so, God, we just want to say thank you for your goodness to us and continue to create in us a heart of generosity to invest the money you give us back into the gospel mission to seek and save the lost. And so, Father, as we bring our tithes and offerings to you now, we do it as an act of worship with gratefulness for the wonderful salvation that you have given to us. Be glorified through our worship and our giving. Be glorified through the rest of the service. We love you and we are so grateful to be in relationship with you because of the salvation that belongs to you. We give you all the glory and we give you all the praise and we pray this in the mighty name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. And everyone said, Amen.
praising my Savior all the day long. Church, lift it up. This is my story. This is my story. This is my song. Praising my Savior. then shall we say in response to these things if God is for us who can be against us he who did not spare his own son but gave him up for us all how will he not also along with him graciously give us all things who shall separate us from the love of Christ shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen, church. Amen. We're going to invite our children now from JK to grade 6 to go to their time of Spark City. Let's continue praising our great God, declaring that Christ is enough. Let's sing.
have decided to follow Jesus, and there is no turning back. Amen? Amen. Please be seated. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's glad to be here this morning. I'm glad to be here this morning. As a lot of you know, the last few months for Susan and I and our lives has been a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, it's had its ups and its downs as we've been working through God's direction in our lives. It was pointed out to me this week that um, the last sermon I preached here at Calvary, uh, I made a statement and had a little bit of time telling you that I don't like change. I think there's a lesson in that for me somewhere. Uh, because at that time, I had no idea what God was planning for our ministry and where Susan and I were going to be led. Not only is it a new responsibility that we're given in a new position, but it's also a brand new church, new city, new place, new people. And I can tell you that by no stretch of the imagination was this an easy thing to work through. It really wasn't. We use the word bittersweet quite often as we talk about this. But the encouragement that we have felt by and large from both churches has just been so encouraging and, and we're so thankful for that. And when I asked Pastor Kelvin, when Pastor Kelvin asked me if I would preach this morning, I said to him, absolutely, brother, what would you like me to preach on? And he said, wherever the Lord directs you. There's a lot in the Bible to work through. And I wasn't sure exactly where to start with that. So the next thing he said to me, or, or the next thing that we've, we talk about when we preach is, you've got to find what is the burden that's on your heart. What is the burden that's on my heart this morning to come and share with you? Because if I can find that, then I'm going to trust that this is where the Lord is directing and so I started to pay pretty close attention to what was happening around me, the people that were talking to us and the things that were being said. And one of the most common questions that have been asked of us since we announced that we were moving on is how did you know? How did you know that it was the Lord that was leading you? To be honest with you, that was our primary concern for quite a long time. How do we know that what we're feeling is from the Lord? Proverbs 16.9 tells us that in the human heart, we make our plans, but it's the Lord that has to establish our steps. Amen? So if people have asked that question and they've said, okay, so how did you know? My response has been almost exclusively... When you know, you know. Right. I mean, that makes total sense to me. I lived it. When you know, you know. But I also understand that that is really not helpful to the people that are asking me the question at all. And so the burden that was placed on my heart this morning was, how do you know? How do you know if it's the Lord that's speaking to you? Now, on the outset, this should seem like a fairly easy question to answer. But that's only if it's rooted in the question of, does God give me leading in my life? This would be a short sermon, because the answer is yes. Or if it was rooted in, should I trust God and his leading, knowing that he is going to lead me? And if it's that, the answer is yes, you should, and yes, he will. The challenge, though, is what we're really asking is, Am I tangibly experiencing God's leading in my life? Am I actually, through the experience and the, the, the feeling and all that I'm working through right now, is it actually from him? And here's why it's hard to answer. It's hard to answer because God knows us individually and he speaks to us individually. So I don't know. I can't give you a here's for sure how you know as how he speaks to you in your life. 
But I do think that there's some good general things that we should be looking at. And as you're discerning, if you're asking yourself, is God speaking to me and I'm not sure, I've got a few things that I want to work through today. Now, in the last series, it's been called On the Move. And don't think for a second that Susan and I haven't found the irony in that. But we've been taking a lot of scripture. Last week, Pastor Nick preached on three chapters. And so I'm going to go the opposite way today. And we're going to focus on one verse. Just one verse today. Now, I should warn you, I say that that that's the the verse we're focusing on, but we're going to be all over the Bible this morning. But if you would, turn with me to John 10, 27. The word of the Lord to us today My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. This is the word of God to us today. Let's just pray. Father, I just give you thanks today for your word. I give you thanks that you are a God who speaks to us. And I give you thanks this morning that you have provided your word for us to to work through. God, I pray for anybody that is here this morning that has this burning question in their heart, Lord, that you would prepare their hearts and their ears to receive your word this morning and for those who may be rejoicing knowing that this is a truth in their day-to-day life, Lord, would you strengthen and would you continue to grow through your word, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So that's the verse. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Now, depending on where you are with your intimacy with Christ, That verse can be really encouraging. You can be listening to that and say, yes, this is my reality. But on the other hand, if you're a person who thinks, I actually relate more to the Israelites when God went silent for 400 years, this verse can be kind of discouraging, can it? Because you question, why am I not hearing God's voice? And there's two things that you want to consider. The first one is that Is it possible that you have not yet received the salvation that the Lord has to offer you? If that's the case, I have great news for you today. The Lord is speaking to you. It is his desire that all will be saved. Pay close attention. And if you know for sure that as we just read in Romans 8 that you are saved, that nothing can separate you from his love and you are convinced of that but you're still not sure... I'm going to suggest to you that there's a few things that maybe you're missing. And so as we work through this text, I want to just focus for a minute on what this verse actually is saying to us first. Let's just start there. The verse is embedded in John chapter 10. Jesus is saying to the disciples and to his people, there are false shepherds out there. There are thieves. There are hired hands. They don't care about you. And Jesus is emphasizing in this verse, but I do. We have a special thing that's happening. His role is as the chief shepherd, and we're the sheep. So let's just break it down for a minute. My sheep is the first part of this. And when we hear that, we think, sheep? I don't want to be a sheep. Let me just tell you for a minute. The Lord Almighty is giving you this designation. And let's not focus right now on the word sheep. Let's focus on the word my. He says they are mine. This first part of this verse is declaring his ownership over you. It's a relationship of you. And not just ownership where he's the master, which he is. But, owner, but the relationship, he calls you his. You are his prized possession. You are his sheep. It is a very special designation that he gives to those that call him Lord and Savior. And the second thing that he says is, they listen to my voice. That doesn't just mean that we hear it. It means that we actually understand and comprehend what it is that he's saying to us. He is the shepherd. We are his sheep. We know his voice. Do you know his voice? 
The third part of this is it says, and they follow me. Oh no, it says, I know, th- it says, I know them. I know them. Think about that. I know them. God, the God of the universe, knows you. It's not just that you know his voice, it's that he knows yours. That's amazing. This is, this, this is a relationship that's, that's happening here. He knows us and he cares for us individually. It's not that he knows us collect, collectively as a group. He knows you and me individually. He knows us. He knows our hearts and our struggles and the things that we're dealing with. He knows all of it. And then last part of this verse is it says, and they follow me. So here's the pattern of it is we know his voice, we are his, we know his voice, and we trust him, so we follow him. The shepherd never wants to lead the sheep somewhere that's going to hurt them. So we're going to trust that Jesus is going to do the same. That's the structure of this verse. It's one verse. We are his We know his voice, he knows us, and so we follow. That's the basis of the verse. But there's benefits to this. The the theological benefits that exist in this are really good. When we are one of those sheep who know his voice, the first thing is, it is celebrating the relationship that Jesus has between us and him. It is an actual relationship that the God of the universe has with his sheep. It is characterized by mutual knowledge and then our trust in him. Who doesn't want a relationship with God? I mean, I... That's like, that's, a, that's an amazing reality that, that people want. They, they want to have that relationship. The second thing that it gives us is divine guidance and leadership. That's amazing. The all-sovereign, almighty, all-powerful, all-present God wants to give you direction and guidance. That is way better than Siri. Or Alexa if you're a non-Apple person. The third thing it gives us is security and assurance. We just sang blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Do you know that when you know that the Lord is talking to you and that he's working in your life, do you know what that's saying? He's proving that you're his. He's proving everything he's saying here. You get security knowing that he's not going to lead you into danger and you get assurance of your salvation. And fourthly, It's a discipleship essential. Look, when we follow in obedience to what Jesus is asking us to do, we get sanctified. We are made more into his image. We grow. Those are the benefits of this. Aren't they all good? I think they're all great. Unless you're sitting here saying, but I'm not experiencing any of that. I don't feel like I'm, I'm getting the most out of that. I hear from him here and then maybe, but I'm certainly not living a lifestyle like this. So what are we to do? What are we to do? Here's the first thing I want to tell you. If you're in that position, and if you're, even if you're not, just understand this reality. God actually wants to communicate with you. I'm going to say that again. God wants to communicate with you. Why is that important? Because the number of people that we meet who come in and say, I don't know if I ever hear from God. I think he's ignoring me. God's not ignoring you. He's not ignoring you. It might be the way you're feeling, but God actually wants this for you. I'm going to show you, we're going to work through a few verses here, uh, and I just, I want you to listen to them, and then pick out where you can see that God wants to communicate with his sheep. In Jeremiah chapter 33, verse 3. Jeremiah 33, 3. Call to me, and I will answer you, and tell you great and unsearchable things that you do not know. You catch it? Call to me, and I might answer you. 
No, I will answer you. He invites us to reach out to him and he promises to respond. In James chapter 1 verse 5, it says, If any of you lack wisdom, you should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to you. He's willing to share his wisdom with you. Divine wisdom, divine guidance, divine leadership. All you have to do is ask. And he gives it, he doesn't just give it, he gives it generously. He wants to communicate and give us his wisdom and guide us as his sheep. It's amazing. It's great. And then in 1 John 5.14, listen to this. It says, this is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. He wants to communicate. He's a God who communicates. He is not ignoring us. And yes, we all have different sensitivities to how that works. And it's great when we look through the Old Testament and we say, look at all the way that God talked to people. Why doesn't he talk to me like that? With Adam, he walked through the garden with them. That would be easier, wouldn't it? Moses, burning bush. Pretty obvious there's a burning bush talking to me. This is, this is divine. What about Noah, the ark? Think about the precision and the direction and instruction that God gave Noah to build the ark. I would love that kind of specific direction from him, wouldn't you? So what's going on? Well, in Hebrews 11, or in Hebrews chapter 1, I should say, in verse 1 and 2, it says, In the past, God spoke to our ancestors through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed heir of all things and through whom also he made the universe. I read that, I've read that verse before many times. You know what I've never noticed before? Is how that verse ends. Think about, this isn't like a little add-on sort of piece of scripture. It says, that all of this, all of his communication, he's spoken to us by his son. And if you're wondering who his son is, he is the heir of all things, and by through, everything has been created. Let's not mistake who it is that's speaking to us here. It's the almighty King Jesus. And that's how he speaks. So the first things we're going to start with this morning that we've started with is, first... God is not ignoring you. He wants to communicate with you. And second, he does that through Jesus. There's, that's how, that's who he does it through. Okay. If that's who he does it through as he sits on the right hand of the Father and he intercedes for us, how does he do it? And this is where we're going to spend the bulk of our time now. In what ways does God actually communicate with us? And the first one is right here. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is God-breathed. Not some of it, all of it is God-breathed. I like to say that when the Bible is open, God is talking. Do you believe that? That when this Bible is open, God is talking to us. And as the sheep, this is how God leads us first and foremost is through his word. Back in Hebrews chapter 4. It says, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. You know, one of the things that, uh, and, and, and it's not necessarily bad, but there's, there's people have plans to read through the whole Bible in like six months. Or they read through the whole Bible in a year. I took a class in seminary. It was an Old Testament theology class. And our assignment over 10 weeks was to read the entire Old Testament. One week, we had to read all of the Psalms and Job. That's a lot. That's a lot. That's 150 songs and then the book of Job. It was a lot. And then we had to send something to our instructor to say, hey, we did it. And he said, how did it feel? And I said, you know what? It was like by the end of it, I was just looking at words. 
I wasn't even really, I, wasn't, I just plowed through this. What did you learn? I learned that when I meditate on a verse, God speaks through it. And he does it in ways that completely might not, you might not expect. See, what happens sometimes is that we treat the Bible like it's a resource book. Like, it's like a dictionary that when we want to see how something's spelled, we're going to go and open it. That's not the purpose of the Bible. It can be used that way. You can go into the Bible, and if you're experiencing something, you can go to the back and the indexes, and you can say, I need scripture that's going to help me. That's, that's okay. But when you're in the Word every single day, and you're reading through it, it ministers to you in different ways. Has anybody been in the Bible, and they've read a verse that they've read a hundred times, and suddenly it's different? Yeah, there's a lot of mm hmms Most people, as you go through that, most of the time, pay attention to that. If suddenly the verse seems different, then God is probably trying to point something to you. And almost always, it's in a passage that you had no idea was going to actually minister to your situation in that moment. One of the things that Susan, um, Susan has this Bible, and I've been telling her for about three years now, can we just get you a new Bible? Because it's falling apart. Like she'll open it and it's like the pages are falling out. And she says, I don't want to give this Bible up. And I said, how come? She says, because every time I open it and it's highlighted somewhere, I know I've been there before. I was like, that's great. And she says, and then when I read it and I realize that I never heard it that way before, I know God's working. That's pretty good. I still think she should get a new Bible though. But this is why you have to be in the Word every day. You have to be in the Word each day. Because when you open this, God is talking to you. And he's going to do it in a way. Listen, it says in verse 12 of chapter 4 in Hebrews, it says God's Word is alive and active. But don't miss verse 13. Because verse 13 says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. Do you think that when you open the word that you're informing God of something? He knows everything you're going through. He knows every situation that you're in. When you open the word and you read it, it ministers to you. It ministers to your situation. He knows with divine precision what you need. But sometimes we just blow by it. We just, we just blow through it. Scripture is not just something God gave us to refer to. It is something he gave us to live through. That's what the word is. That's how he's communicating with us. And it is the consistent source of truth in a world that is changing truth on a second by second basis. But this never changes. Amen? Come on, church. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you. Secondly, he speaks to us through his word, but he also speaks to us through prayer. You know, we say here at Calvary that prayer is one of our five essentials. It's the air that we breathe. In Esther chapter 5, Esther has been married to the king. His name is Artaxerxes or Xerxes, depending on the, 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 the version you have. And she dons the royal garments for the very first time. She comes out, she's referred to in Esther 5 for the first time as Queen Esther. And she did it because she's going to go into the throne room and approach her husband. Likely she hasn't seen him in weeks or potentially months at this point. And she's going to walk in and she's going to ask him to have a couple of feasts. And she's doing that because she's trying to protect her people. Now to us right now we go, what's the big deal? A wife approaches her husband. Here's the big deal. Back in the ancient Near East, if you did that uninvited and you approached the king, it, the, the, you, were, you could be sentenced to death. You were not allowed to go into the throne room. Now, by God's sovereignty in the situation, the king granted her mercy. But when we approach the throne of God in prayer... This is not the situation we're under. Yes, it's mercy. Yes, it's grace. Yes, we are sinners. We don't even deserve an audience with the king. But guess what? He invites you there. 
You are not walking in to the throne room uninvited. Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but catch this. In every situation, in prayer, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. That doesn't say in some situations. That doesn't say in bad situations. That says specifically in every situation. And in every situation as we step in, we go to God and we say, okay, here are my prayers and petitions. And then we leave. That is not what prayer is for. Prayer is not a one-way conversation where we write our needs and wants to the almighty King Jesus and we say, Lord, here's what I want and here's what I need. He already knows that. You're going in and you're saying, God, speak to me about these things. We're not going in so that God will change his mind. We're going in so God will change our mind. That's the purpose of prayer. It's a two-way conversation. And we have to be ready to hear it. I met with a woman a few weeks ago, really troubled about a situation she had at work. She said, I just feel like I need to, I need to leave this situation. And I said, okay. Okay. Why are you so unsettled by it? And she says, I just don't know if I'm doing the right thing. And of course, I played the pastor card and said, have you prayed about it? And she said, no, I don't want to talk to him right now. He might tell me to stay. That's not what we're supposed to do. We want to go in and be willing to be changed. That's the posture of prayer. The posture of prayer is if you want to hear from God, You have to listen to him and be ready to receive what he might tell you, no matter how difficult it is. Third, God communicates to us through the Holy Spirit. And this one is potentially one of the harder ones to navigate through. Why? I mean, it's God treating us individually and giving us him through the Holy Spirit to minister to us. So why is that so hard? It's actually the part of God that we have the closest relationship with because we are indwelt with him. The reason that it's hard is because there's another voice that I like better. And it's mine. My voice is the best voice in my perception to listen to sometimes, isn't it? You know why? Because it always agrees with me. I love when my voice agrees with me. Now, you have to be searching. You have to be looking at, you know, if you ever watch a football game, um, because I always have to talk about football somewhere. But if you see a quarterback and he, he puts his hands over the holes on his helmet, he's not trying to keep them warm. Almost always, there's a couple of players on the field that will have a green dot on the back of their helmet. The quarterback is always one. And as you, as he's covering, what he's doing is he's trying to listen to the coach. He's got a headset in there and the coach is informing him and is giving him guidance and is saying, hey, run this play, do that. It's not perfect, but it's helpful. The headset that we have that we just need to put our hands over the ear holes and say, I want to hear it, is perfect. The difference is he might be leading us somewhere that we don't want to go. But it's good. It's all good for him. Because the truth is, when we submit to the leading of the Holy Spirit, what we're actually saying is, my voice, I don't trust it anymore. When you understand that you are flawed, when you understand that your voice may sound good for a minute, but it's probably not leading the right way, you can't trust it. But you can trust God. You can't trust it. So part of it is that we have to shut it down. And what God does is really cool. Because what happens is that we have a thought or a feeling or an urge or something that we're going to go through. And here's what the Holy Spirit does. It evaluates it for you. Isn't that great? You have God inside of you who will evaluate the situation. And it will say to you, yes, I want you to do this. Or no, I don't want you to do this. Or yes, be patient on that. Or don't jump ahead. Or whatever that is. But it's going to help you get the answer. And you're going to know if you pay attention to it. But too often we just shut it down. 
Too often it's just something that we, we shut down, but the way it works for me is that there's a, like a nudge. Like I feel this sort of like, hey, that's kind of, I don't know, I don't think it actually does that, but it feels like just sort of like a little tap. You might want to pay attention to this. When I was first saved, I remember there was a bunch of stuff. I was living in a way that there was no way I should be living as a Christian. I was brand new and he was going to start working away, but he was spending a lot of time saying, um, can you, like, you should not be doing this. And the best part was I started justifying it. Yeah, I'm doing stuff with people, but don't worry, it's my mission field. The Holy Spirit evaluated that one pretty quick and said, you are a liar to yourself right now. That's not what this is. That's you trying to feed yourself. And then, as he worked away, it went from a nudge to a shove. And it was, no, you're going to do this. And I remember, I remember very vividly tapping out to something he was asking me to not do. And I said, fine, I'm done. I give up. I tap out. And I went to bed that night. And I said, I'm finally going to get some rest. Because he's been hounding me about this. And as I closed my eyes and thought, finally, a good night's sleep, he said... I'm not done yet. <laughs> really? We're going to do this again? Yeah, and it's going to be as easy as you make it. Submit. Surrender. Let me chip away. Fourth, he works through circumstances. God uses our circumstances. Have you ever been in a situation and you ask yourself, why in the world would God put me here right now? Amen? Amen? Okay, for those of you who just said amen, how many people, when you are, if you're honest with yourself, thought of a negative situation? Why did God put me in this spot? I don't want to be here. That's usually the way we think. Because it makes sense. We're supposed to pick up our cross and follow him daily. We're supposed, to, uh, we're supposed to consider it joy when we experience trials of all kinds, right? So the trials are what we pay attention to. When's the last time you had something going really, really well and you said to yourself, why in the world did God put me in this situation? Birth of a child. Birth of a grandchild. Why did God put me here? What is my purpose with this? Maybe it's something like, why did God let my car that should be dead on the side of the road survive another day and get me to work? Why is, he, why is he helping me through this? Maybe it's something, something bigger. Maybe it's, it's that he puts somebody in front of you or, or he brings you back to somebody you haven't spoken to in years. Or he brings someone to mind for you. And he says, you know what? You, it's this person you need to be talking to. And you say, why did God put me there? The situations and the circumstances that we have... You have to remember, what we like to do is stand in a little zone that we make for ourselves called the safe zone. As long as I'm here, no matter what God gives me, I can handle it. I don't want this and I don't want that, but all I want is to make sure that right now I am safe and secure and that is as defined by my situation and my circumstance, so I am going to stay right here. Here's the problem. No matter how good you think this is and no matter how bad you think this is, if it's really bad, it's going to get better. And if it's really good, it's probably not going to stay that way forever because life doesn't work that way. So we're not supposed to just stay like this. God's going to use circumstances to get us to move. The secular world calls this the pleasure and pain principle. And here's the way it works. We stand and we say, we're not going to do anything. The pain part of it is something really bad is coming and we go, I'm not staying there. And the pain got us to move. Or the pleasure principle is we see it over here and we think, man, I really want that. That's going to be better than where I am now. So I'm going to head that way. That's not the way that God necessarily works with us. It's more of what we call a push and a pull. And here's the way it works. Where God puts us and he says, here's where I want you right now. And you expect change to happen. At some point, that direction of where he wants you is going to shift. And he's going to say, I don't want you here anymore. I want you over there. 
And so we're standing going, but I'm in the same spot. This was so good. Why am I not hearing from God? Why is nothing happening? I'm not, I'm right where I'm happy. And he says, no, you're not. You're where you're happy, but I want you over there. And as long as we're in where his will is, it's going to feel better. And as soon as you're not in his will anymore and you're fighting going where he wants you to be, it's going to get uncomfortable. It just is. So where do you go? You always, you want to hear from God, you've got to be obedient to where you feel he's directing you. So as, the, as, as his, his vision and as his communication says, I want you to do this, step in obedience. That's what he wants from us. He's not going to drag us, but we are going to be left out like this. You guys remember Jonah, right? Go here. No. Okay. <laughs> it's not going to go well. What did Jesus do in the garden? When, they, when he said, if there's any other way, let this cup pass. But if not, your will be done. God, I don't want to go where, I, where, where you're going to take me, but if you direct me, I'm going to step out in obedience. Are you being Jonah or are you being like Jesus? These circumstances that we have are always going to change. But when you seek God's place for you, it's going to be so much more rich in our lives. And the fifth way is he does it through other believers. There's nothing quite like being around other believers, is there? I love being around the body of Christ because we are brothers and sisters. We are family. We are a little dysfunctional, but we're family. And God will use other believers. Proverbs 27, 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Remember how I said to you that the, the Holy Spirit, sometimes we're not really paying attention to the Holy Spirit? Here's what God does sometimes. When I'm so boneheaded that there's no way that I'm listening to what the Holy Spirit is telling me, the same Holy Spirit that lives in me also lives in my brothers and my sisters. And so God goes to somebody a little less stubborn and says, hey, do me a favor, go tell him what I want him to hear. That's the same Holy Spirit using other people to come and tell us what we want and what he wants us to do. And sometimes it's a one-off. And sometimes it's completely unexpected. I had a dear friend, a sister come to me. As we were going into this candidating weekend, I was thinking a lot about what are they going to ask and how is this going to go and all of these things. And she came into my office one day and she said, listen, I just have to say something to you. The, and it's, she says, I never do this, but I'm feeling impressed on my heart that I need to tell you, please just be yourself. I thought, wow, that's profound. That's a lot different than my strategies. And I'm going to tell you, for the entire weekend, all I kept thinking was, just be myself, just be myself. Just, it was one person who was faithful enough to come and tell me the truth. I love having people that tell us the truth. Because you never know how God's going to speak to us through that. Other times, it's people that come en masse. It's different things that happen over and over, where different people keep telling you the same thing over and over and over again. And as you work through that and you go, why is it? This is a coincidence, right? No, it's not a coincidence. God is using this multitude of people to get your attention. The secular world will say it's coincidence. We live differently than that. God speaks to us through other believers. And it could be something about your faith. You know how many times people come to church and they say, well, here's the thing. I had like nine people talk to me about God in the last two weeks, so I figured I better come and check this out. Praise those people for their obedience because God was using it and he speaks through other people. Maybe it's somebody you haven't talked to in a long time. This is the way this always works, by the way. When you put all of this together, here's how you know you're hearing from God. Here's how you seek hearing him. So you get up in the morning and you open the word and you say, I'm going to do my devotional. And it's talking about restoration of relationships. And you're like, that's weird. I don't know where that came from. And then you're praying and God reminds you. And he says, listen, remember, if you don't forgive other people, I'm not going to forgive you. You go, wow, that's, that's a lot to deal with. And then the Holy Spirit starts convicting you and you start thinking about a person more and more and more and more and more. And then the circumstance comes up and you think to yourself, you know, 
I'm going to see them next week. What am I going to do? And then like nine people come up and say, you know who I was thinking about the other day? That person. And you're like, okay. Like God is going to, he blends this all together. But because we're so busy all the time and because we make our lives so busy and because we're so dependent on our own perception of the situation, we blow right by it all the time. We miss it all the time. We have to get intentional about how we're going to live. The last time this happened to me was my, my, my birth father. I haven't spoken to, I've spoken to him twice in about 30 years. He doesn't really want to talk to me. He's sort of denied me in the new life he's living. He says he doesn't have kids, so me showing up kind of wrecks that for him. But I really felt compelled by people and by the spirit that I needed to go and do something with that. And I realized that it wasn't restoration that the Lord was directing me to. It was my own personal forgiveness that he was directing me to. He put me in a position through the, through the encouragement of other people, through the power of the Holy Spirit, through prayer. I went and I saw him and I was able to forgive him. That's all I needed. Drop that weight. It's amazing how that works. But you can't just sit back and wait. So I'm going to finish with this and we're going to work through this last part really quickly. But how do you then cultivate a listening heart? What are you supposed to do to make sure that your heart is set up to be listening for things? And the first one is this. It's be still and quiet. Anybody else find that hard? You know, Jesus himself would get away to be, spend time with the Father, wouldn't he? He's getting, he's getting people coming after him as he's doing his ministry. And he would go and he'd get time alone. And is the reason that you want to be alone because it's distraction free? Partly. But more than that, it's that it's intentional. I can say to Susan, want to go out tonight? She says, where are we going? I said, I don't know. She's like, well, that's okay. <laughs> or I can say to her, hey, I have a plan tonight. Uh, I'm so excited and uh, I got a plan for you. And she says, where are we going? I say, it's a surprise. And you know what she says to me every time? That's not fair. You get to look forward to it all day. I don't even get to look forward to it all day. And I say, well... Okay, here's where we're going. And you know what she says to me almost every time after? She says, thank you for making, for being intentional about the time you're spending with us. Thanks for making today a great day. Thank you for letting me look forward to that. Folks, the God of the universe is looking forward to you being intentional with your time that you're going to spend with him. Be intentional with it. If you're not being intentional with it, you're probably not going to hear from him as well. Well, actually, you're not going to hear from him as well. When do you have it? When is your time? Is it in the morning when you first get up? Is it at lunchtime? Is it at dinner? Is it when you're going to bed? Is it when you go for a walk? Does God ever make time for you? And what I mean by that is, for me, it's 3 a.m. If I wake up and I look at the clock and it says 3 a.m., I'm going to be up for a bit because he's like, if you're not going to make time, I'm going to make time for us. Are you intentional? Here's the other thing I hear. I'm too busy for this. Make time. Set your alarm earlier. Give something up to talk to him and to seek him. And then consider your posture with it. When you go to spend time with the Lord, is it a chore? Is it something you get to do? You wake up and you say, you know what? Today's devotional time. I'm excited. I'm going to just get up and I don't even want to do this. My phone's sitting right there. I see five notifications. I should probably look at that. But I better get this done first. Okay, speed, speed, check through, check through, check mark, done. Is that the way we're supposed to spend time? Not at all. Your posture is and must be, I have breath this morning because God sustained me through the night so that he could then work in my life and I get to spend time with him. Imagine that if I said to Susan on date night, you know what, we're just gonna check this off the list. What a mess. What a mess. No, it's, it's the posture is I get to. I get to go and be changed by the living God today. I get to be aware and my sense is heightened and I get to hear his voice more. Because I'm his sheep and I want to know his voice. And he knows me and I'm going to follow him. That's what we want. But it requires discipline too. Being still and quiet requires discipline. Here's my confession for the day. 
When I first started working at Calvary, we had um, pr like a prayer meeting in the morning. And I remember the very first prayer meeting I went to, I was like, this is amazing. I'm around all of these godly men and, and women and I'm going to be in prayer with them for this devoted amount of time. And they said, okay, well, what are the prayer requests? And we reviewed them all and we wrote them down. And then they said, listen, just grab something off the list and pray. And I said, this is awesome. I'm not going to go first because I'm new. But I'm going to wait and I'm going to be praying. And I'm praying. And about two minutes in, I realized I'm thinking about what I needed to buy on the way home for dinner. Here's the problem. I don't know what anybody just prayed for. I'm about to go into prayer with these new men who are evaluating me, I feel. And here I am going and saying, I don't even know what you said. Because it required discipline. It required training. And not because I fear man, but because that's how we're supposed to approach the throne room of God. If you're thinking about everything else, you are not getting ready to hear the word back from him. You are not meaning that it's a two-way communication piece. The second thing that you have to do is you have to be obedient. If the Lord is directing something that is obvious, start to do it. If he's saying you need to uh, work on a forgiveness piece with this person, just do it. You don't need to pray on whether you need to forgive somebody. It's a command. If he says, you know, you know if, it's, if it's, you need to be more generous with your time, your talents, and your treasures, just do it. You don't need to pray on that. You need to pray on other things for sure. But if you're wrapped up and you've got a sin going on in your life right now, and you absolutely know for sure that God is saying, drop it. And you're like, I don't know why God's not talking to me. Let me tell you why he's not talking to you. Because you're not living obediently to the scriptures. He's not going, you're, you're not going to hear him if you're clinging to your sin. You have to let it go. But you also don't have to wait for a catastrophe. You don't have to wait for the situation to go bad to say, you know what? I guess God's talking to me because it got so bad. I have to do something. It's not that at all. Which is why the third thing you have to do is be patient. And that can be really difficult sometimes, can it? I'm not a real patient guy. I like things done. Good thing I wasn't an Israelite walking through the desert. 40 years. And I'm thinking we're going in circles and what's going on. I wouldn't have done well. But here's why being patient is so important. Because how God ministers to you, when he ministers to you through the word, when he ministers to you through prayer, through the Holy Spirit, when he ministers to you through circumstances and through other people, if you're so quick to get to the finish line, you're going to miss how he's doing it through the whole process. Slow down and pay attention to what God's putting through for you because the only way you're going to get to know what he's saying is by following that path. And finally, you have to be discerning. You have to be discerning. You have to weigh it against scripture. You have to weigh it through prayer. You have to weigh it through your circumstances. You've got to weigh it through the Holy Spirit. You've got to weigh it through other people. Weigh it. If it's, if, if it's saying, you know, I think I, I don't know, something, something that's not biblical, then it's probably, then the Holy Spirit's going to minister to that. If you're just trying to do something on your own and saying, I'm going to make a giant purchase today, pray through that first and see, let that, let the Holy Spirit do his work. Watch the circumstances that come up. Don't just blow by them because we're too busy. But you have to remember that God wants to communicate with us. He really does. He's a God who loves us and who wants to communicate to us. And being intentional is just going to benefit us. This is what he laid on my heart for us today. Tonight, I'm going to share a little bit with you about the specifics of how he did that with us. This is just general, but I'm going to share a little bit about what we felt, how we knew, all of those sorts of things. And the only reason I want to share that with you is so he gets the glory. I want you to see the work that the Lord does and what he's done in our lives, and we want to give him the glory for that. I hope you'll come back and join us, but I do pray that in this next song, I pray we're going to sing a song about abiding in him. Just abide in him right now. Let him minister to you through song, through the Holy Spirit. Let's leave here this morning with the volume turned up on the Lord's voice so that we may be obedient to give him all the glory. Let's pray together. Father, we give you thanks today for your goodness and your grace to us that you have called us to be your sheep. What a reality that is that we are called yours. 
And God, that you want to communicate with us, that you speak to us, you make yourself, you make us aware of you. And God, that you know everything that we're dealing with, every situation, every thought, every word, every, every action that we have right now, Lord, you know it. God, would you search our hearts, show us those things, remove all the obstacles that are stopping us from hearing you. And then, Lord, I pray that through the power of the Holy Spirit, which only you can do, that we will follow you. The King of kings, the Lord of lords, and our chief shepherd, I pray in his mighty name. Amen. Jesus tells us that if we abide in him, then he will abide in us and we will bear much fruit. So church, would you stand with us and let's together declare that we will abide, we will remain in Christ. Let's sing.
abide. We are called his sheep. And it came at a very heavy cross, at a very heavy price. The cost was the blood of the sinless one. And while we were still sinners, he died for us. And he did that with purpose. Please do not leave here today if you're struggling. We have pastors that are going to be up front. We have pastors in our connections room. Leave here today and be sensitive and aware and intentional so that we may go out into the world and reflect his glory. Amen. Have a great week.